And how many years was Lonnie around for all of this? Very short period of time. He was almost like getting the car started. Yeah. You know, that little explosion. And meanwhile, the counterculture movement is happening and all these hippie kids are on drugs and rebelling against culture. And, and Chuck wanted nothing to do with them. Mm -hmm. But Kay, his wife, had a heart for these hippies. In fact, I found this out later. So we went to see Lonnie and I remember it so vividly. It was, the room was very dark. There was a big fire in the fireplace. And Lonnie was emaciated. He looked horrible. Bruce Lawn. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an incredible guest with us today. I cannot wait to have this conversation. I promise you, you are going to be encouraged, inspired, uh, and just walk away from this conversation with, uh, I think, a lot of good things in your spirit. And so without any further ado, um, I'm going to call him the legend. No. The legend himself, ladies and gentlemen, Pastor Greg Laurie. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Ruslan, thanks for having me on. I love your studio. It's super cool. Thank you. All these cool little cameras moving around, and uh, it's just great to be here with you. I've watched so many times, so it's interesting to actually go to the place where it's done and see how you do it, but uh, I, I love the, your take on things and how you're so current and up to speed on so many things that are happening. So thank you for what you do. All right. Well, thank you so much for that. The, the, the words of affirmation mean a lot. Um, so Jesus Revolution, your life story yeah. on the big screen this coming Friday, next Friday. We're in a week, right? 24th. Yes. That Actually, there's going to be a pre-release on the 22nd. Okay. And um, I kind of call it weaponized art. And, you know, I believe in doing things in a beautiful, artistic, professional way. And I would have not trusted anybody else with my story than the Irwin brothers. Because I think they're the finest Christian filmmakers. Well, just take the word Christian off for a moment. I think they're among the finest filmmakers today. And they happen to be believers who really want to use their skill and their platform to point people to Christ. And so I was very happy when John Irwin came and wanted to do this film. It didn't start being about my life, but that's the way he wrote the screenplay and, and then put it together. So, I, you know, on the 22nd, it's sort of a pre-release night where, where we added a gospel presentation. That's okay. what I mean by weaponized art. It'll it. still be the film, uh -huh. but I present the se a seven-minute version of the gospel complete with a prayer that a person could pray. So we're hoping that folks will go out to the theaters, get tickets, bring friends that don't know the Lord yeah. on February 22nd. Then it opens nationwide on February 24th in 2,700 theaters wow. around America. Wow. Wow. I, I love the film. I watched I it. Um, I, I, I started on an airplane, and then I finally got to watch it here yesterday yeah. and finish it at home. Yeah. And... Man, is that a roller coaster of a film? Mm. There was I a lot of twists and turns. A lot of twists yeah. and turns. A lot of tears shed on yeah. on my end. Yes. Um, Tell me what grabbed you. Well, you know what? I'll be honest. Your story with your mother. Yeah. Uh, we we have a very strong parallel there. Oh wow. Uh, my mom uh, just got clean maybe two years ago. Wow. Uh, after she fell and broke her hip. Yeah. And uh, excuse me, she she because she had bad hips, she fell and broke her shoulder. Yeah. And so the entire parallel of of like finding Jesus completely outside of my family. Yeah. And then the tension of how to navigate that yeah. conversation and, yeah. and how to have healthy boundaries. Yeah. But at the same time, encourage her and be there for her and honor her as yeah. as the as the commandments say we should. That's true. It it was tricky. It was tricky. And we ju I mean I'm I'm just turned 38 and we just got to a much better place probably yeah. a year or two ago. Um there was the bit about um your dad and, yeah. and how you thought he left you, but you yeah. really left him and and, yeah. and and I didn't discover this in my life until I was much older and I wow. con I confronted my dad me and my dad are in a great place now and he kind of gave me his side of the story and I was wow. like yeah mom it was you like it wasn't yeah. just dad it was yeah. you so there was there were so many moments mm. uh personally that hit me very heavy mm. and then I would say the I think the heart for revival the yeah. heart for the parallels of of what happened in the 70s and the yeah. 60s with the hippies movement to a lot of what yeah. we're seeing today. Yeah. Uh, drug use is on the rise. Yes. Uh, ending your own life is on the rise. Yes. Despair is on the rise. So so there was also just like this like stirring of like, yeah. 
man, this is, this is, this, this, this is, these gen this generation needs this. Yeah. I can't think of a more parallel time than the late 60s, early 70s, and today. Mm -hmm. You know, so I just turned 70 recently. So I've lived through a few decades, lived through the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and to this day. The 80s weren't parallel. The 90s weren't parallel. The early 2000s were, but there's something about this modern moment we're in with the things you mentioned, the, the increase of drug use. I read the other day, more people are smoking marijuana than cigarettes now. It's wow. And now it's mainstream. It's legal. You can get it pretty much anywhere. Mm -hmm. LSD has made a comeback, mm -hmm. ironically. Mm -hmm. And of course, now we have the fentanyl deaths that mm -hmm. are just out of control. And, and I, I think so, social media amplifies everything mm -hmm. so much. And so I feel like, wow, this message of this movie feels really current mm -hmm. and I'm always interested to see how older and younger people connect to it. Older yeah. folks, it's like a flashback, mm -hmm. to use the 60s mm -hmm. term. Mm -hmm. You know, they're reliving their early days as a Christian. Yep. But for younger people like yourself, it's connecting like now. Mm -hmm. And like it feels current to them. And, you know, the Bible does say there's nothing new under the sun. Yeah. So, But at the same time, I think the way the Irwin brothers shot it, specifically John Irwin and Brent McCorkle, the other director, it was done in a way where it feels like it's happening in this moment. Yeah. It had such a nostalgic coming yeah. of age feel to it. It, yeah. it, it. it felt parts of it felt like the sandlot at times or Forrest Gump. Yeah. It just gave me that like I, I don't know if movies like this are made anymore. Like yeah. it, it felt really warm and the the music, the sounds, the the soundtrack, it was like, wow, this this really captured this moment that I had nothing, I had no idea what the yeah. 60s or 70s, but just from watching other films and yeah. stuff like that. And so how much of that would you say was intentional in, just, in terms of just kind of, it felt like a 90s movie in terms yeah. of the coming of age theme yeah. of it. How much was that of that would you say was was intentional? I think it was all, I think everything you see in the screen is intentional. Yeah. Um, but what I love about it is, is I think people are surprised that there are laugh out loud moments. Mm -hmm. It's comedic at times. Yes. There's very emotionally stirring times where you're brought to tears and I've watched it with audiences now many times and I kind of know when the moment is coming mm -hmm. so I'll kind of look at them and watch the reaction and, and it's pretty predictable so I think they really went in here with an intentionality but I think where they caught lightning in a bottle and I even felt this when we were shooting the film because part of it was shot in Alabama hmm. a lot of movies are, are filmed in Alabama now. interesting yeah so there's a little town in Alabama called Fairhope yep that reminds you of California, uh -huh. right on the water. And they shot a lot of the scenes that took place in Newport Beach yep. in Fairhope, Alabama. Interesting. And it was also shot in Newport Beach. But there were times on this set, and there's one scene in particular folks will see, but it's when Greg goes to church for the first time. Mm -hmm. And they were singing these worship songs. Mm -hmm. And he walks in and he's very uncomfortable. But you, you, there's something going on there. You can sense God's presence. And I said to John Irwin, the director, I said, I felt like I went back in time. Wow. It felt so close to the way it was. And what I said to John early on was, John, we've got to make people experience this. Mm -hmm. You know, I can preach a sermon about it, but it can only go so far with the sermon. Yep. We can show a photograph, but photos look dated, and, and it's hard to be pulled into that. But what he did was he made it immersive, where you feel like you're there. And that was the objective, and that's what he was trying to do. And during the baptism scene, which is at the halfway point of the film, when mm -hmm. Greg, young Greg, played by Joel Courtney, is baptized by evangelist Lonnie Frisbee, played mm -hmm. by Jonathan Rumi, mm -hmm. best known for playing the role of Jesus, um, the reason that feels so real is because God was at work on that day. Mm. The fact of the matter is there were a number of people that were extras on the set yeah. that were coming to Christ and being baptized for real wow. as we were filming the scene. And there's one character that's in the film that came to me off camera and said, I want to be baptized. I shared the gospel with them. I prayed with them. And while John Irwin was shooting the baptism scene of the movie, Greg, the real Greg was baptizing this guy like 10 feet away. Wow. And they all of a sudden stopped and looked over. It was all happening spontaneously. It wow. wasn't planned. Wow. And so I think that comes across in the screen. It feels like this is yeah. happening. Yeah. And I think because God was actually working. How how long have you guys been working on this film uh, from concept to, and when did you guys kind of start shooting and all that? Yeah, seven years. 
is ago, John Irwin came to me with a copy of Time magazine. Mm -hmm. And it's that that sort of psychedelic image of Jesus on the cover. It says Jesus Revolution. He said, someone told me that you were here at this movement and I wanted to talk to someone who was there and I want to make a movie about this. Mm. John, at that moment, was in his late 30s. He's probably maybe 40 now. But he said, I want to make a movie about this. So we became friends and it was intention, his intention to make it sooner and other things got on the way and postponed it. And the can kept getting kicked down the road, mm-hmm. so to speak. And then it was going to be filmed. And then I still believe uh, it was slotted instead, the story of my friend Jeremy Camp. Mm-hmm. No, excuse me. Yeah, I still believe. Right. And then then finally, okay, now we're going to film Jesus mm-hmm. Revolution. And COVID hit. Mm-hmm. And it threw everything off by months. Mm-hmm. So we started shooting it over a year ago. And, you know, first you've got to write the script. Yep. And then the script goes through all kinds of approvals and back and forth. Then once that's done, you have to cast it. Mm-hmm. That takes time. Mm-hmm. And then after you cast it, you have to scout your locations and figure out where you're going to shoot it. Then you bring in, I didn't know any of this before. Mm-hmm. Then you have to bring in wardrobe. And then you, and it was a huge production, mm-hmm. you know, when we were shooting this thing, this all these trailers and huge wardrobe section. It was really cool. My wife went there in this giant room filled with all this vintage clothing from the late 60s. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It was actually a lot of fun. And then, you know, you get it all set, and and then you shoot it. And then after you shoot it, you start the editing process. Then you score it. Mm-hmm. And every song you hear in the movie, you have to get special rights yep. and permissions to use that song. Oh, yeah. You have to pay fees for those songs yep. if they're like, popular rock songs. And then Brent McCorkle, the co-director, also wrote a lot of the music for it. So mm-hmm. he scores the film. And then, you know, it goes through more editing, uh, pro- uh, longer editing process. And then about a year ago, we had what we called the director's cut. Mm-hmm. So we started just taking this around and showing it to test audiences. Yeah, yeah. That's what you saw. Yep. So the final version, now I've seen it. And I went up to Sony Studios one day and they this is where they worked on the sound. And I was so amazed at what a difference enhanced sound brought to this uh-huh. movie. Okay, Everything was bigger and more powerful. And in the earlier cuts, sometimes some of the dialogue you couldn't understand. Now everything's crystal clear. Mm-hmm. And, and boy, I'm really pleased with how it turned out. So the version I saw was two hours long. Yeah, that's it. Th- that's going to be the one that people see Pretty in theaters? Much. Yes. Wow. Now, how does... Sony and Lionsgate and all these people play into the factor. Like how does like how does that all come together? Because oftentimes Christians in Hollywood is like yeah. oil and water and people freak out. But I think this is incredible that they're yeah. you know getting behind stuff like this and putting it in over two thousand theaters. Yeah. How did that Lionsgate and Sony and all that? How did that come together? Well, John Irwin has his own company, the Irwin Brothers, and they did. I can only imagine. I still believe. And they were independent filmmakers. So when they would make a film, they would go out and they would raise the money for their film. Wow. That's how they did them. Okay. So they got on the radar screen of Lionsgate, which is a major film studio. Yep. They do John Wick and mm-hmm. Hunger Games mm-hmm. and films like that. So they realize that there's an audience out there that mm-hmm. is not being served. Mm-hmm. The Christian audience were ignored, were marginalized, were mocked, were, it, you know, it's like everything but us. We have things, you know, product need for everyone, but our audience, which yeah. is such a huge part of America yes. still. Yes. So Lionsgate, I think it was a business decision. Mm. They thought we want to reach this audience. <laughs> so <laughs> they brought in John Irwin and basically said, you do what you do. Mm. You know your people better than we know them, but we're here to fund it. And so now instead of John having to go out and raise the money, mm-hmm. uh, Lionsgate funded it. Wow. And so he had to just get the movie done on time they, you know, they have very tight guidelines and and budgets, and you have to, you know, you can't go over the budgets and all that, mm-hmm. and and then they have money set aside for marketing, et cetera. So he he is a his own company now inside of Lionsgate. It's called Kingdom Story Company, mm. and so they do the films, but they're a part of Lionsgate. This seems like a really well put together film in terms of, it, like, this does not have uh, kind of the historic Christian trope of yeah. Christian films. This seems extremely well put together, high quality, 
yeah. all around acting, lighting, music. It, it just feels like like an incredible film. Do you think that they're what we're seeing what happened with the chosen, yeah. what we're seeing what happened in other aspects of media, Christian YouTube, all these different yeah. things, music? Do you feel like there's a, a Christian art renaissance happening? I do, and I feel it's very similar to the birth of contemporary Christian music. Mm-hmm. You know, when when Jesus music, as we once called it, first started. It was not a bunch of guys that said, hey, let's create a new industry. Let's create a new type of music, you know, like country music, classical music, Christian music. Mm -hmm. It was more like, hey, God's changed our life. Let's communicate through music because Mm -hmm. music was so popular back then. Still is, but it was different back then. We would look to musicians for direction. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, you know, they were the blind leading the blind. Mm -hmm. And then in my generation, when we started seeing rock icons die one after another, you know, Brian Jones of the Rolling Stones, Jim Morrison of the Doors, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, all ironically dying at the age of 27. Mm -hmm. It was like, wow, what's going on? Mm -hmm. So, But music was a very important communication tool back then. I would say the way we look at music today is maybe a little bit different. But um, so this industry began to form, but it was a lot of creative. So I was a graphic designer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was doing graphic design and there were other people doing music and it was like this creative community. And Mm -hmm. and I started out as an artist, Mm -hmm. not as a preacher. Mm -hmm. I I still love art. I'm still involved in design. Mm -hmm. And so that was the birth of our little, you know, movement of art and music. And now you fast forward to today a lot of it has become very predictable. Mm. Christian music is predictable. Mm-hmm. There's a certain sound it seems to often have. Mm-hmm. Uh, Christian film is very predictable, mm-hmm. often heavy-handed, lower quality, not usually well-acted, and I won't be specific, but I, I'm not a huge fan of it, frankly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, But these guys, the Irwin brothers, wanted to do something different. They say, first and foremost, we want to make a good movie. We want to entertain you yeah. without apology. Yep. We want it to be of the highest quality. But what I said to John was, John, let's do something I've never seen done before. Let's actually get the gospel right Mm. in a Christian film. Yeah. Let's show the darkness of the old life, Mm -hmm. honestly. But when Greg comes to Christ, let's try to show what a conversion looks like. It's hard to film conversion. Yeah, yeah. How do you film conversion? Yeah. So he uses the metaphor of baptism, which is very dramatic. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, there's a moment where Lonnie and Greg pray, Jonathan and uh, Joel, they pray. Yeah. And I, I took a lot of time with Jonathan Rumi going over that prayer. I mm-hmm. said, this is the kind of prayer I would pray. Mm-hmm. And then he would repeat it. and It would be a little different each time. Mm-hmm. And, and I wasn't even sure if it was going to be exactly right. But man, when he did it, it felt really real mm-hmm. because he internalized it. He's a great actor mm-hmm. and, and he understood it. And then he did it, yeah. and it felt genuine. Yeah. And and so I feel this is the most, I don't want to say unchristian Christian film I've ever seen because it's very Christian, yeah. but it's the least predictable Christian yeah. film I've ever seen. Yeah. And then at the halfway point when Greg's converted, you think, well, this is it. Yep. But then it takes twists and turns oh, yeah. that are unexpected. Yeah. How was it working with Joel? Joel is the actor who played Great. you, correct? Yeah. And, and, and what was that like? And, like, how particular were you with the the lines and, and just kind of helping him understand who young Greg was? Yeah, you know, um, it's all decided in the script, but uh-huh. sometimes there's some changes made, you know, when you're filming it. But uh, I really like Joel. Joel, I think, had in some ways the most challenging performance in the film because mm-hmm. the other character is Kelsey Grammer, who's a master actor. Amazing. We know him as Frasier. Yes. But he was trained in, you know, as a Shakespearean actor. Yeah. He went to Juilliard. This wow. guy has huge bandwidth as an actor that I was not aware of until I saw this film. Yeah. Jonathan Rumi, we know him as Jesus, but when people see him as Lonnie, they're gonna realize, you know, how how able how skilled he is as an actor to become these people. Yes. And uh, even the lady, the young lady who plays my wife, Anna Grace Barlow, plays Kathy Laurie, they're all kind of fiery characters. Mm-hmm. Greg is more restrained because Mm -hmm. Greg is broken. Greg is a young man who has had to grow up fast and take care of his alcoholic mother Mm -hmm. who's been married and divorced seven times. His father He's never had a father in his life. He's always on the road, always on the move. So he's withdrawn. He's closed off to the world. And Joel played that very well. But then we see Greg opening up 
after his conversion, we see him accepting love from others and now giving it to others. Mm -hmm. And it was a very subtle and powerful performance, I think, that Joel Courtney brought to it. And I was able to help him and Jonathan because I knew Lonnie personally. Yeah. And, I, you know, because he'd say, what was it like when Lonnie walked in a room? Mm -hmm. And and I said, I'll tell you, when Lonnie walked in a room, the, the, the whole mood of the room would change. Mm -hmm. that, that's the kind of guy he was. And I talked to Kelsey a lot about Chuck, and then we talked about how we actually do certain things because these guys had never baptized anyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went out and said, this is how you baptize yeah. someone. Are they sprinkling water? Yeah. How do we do it? They you know? didn't know. <laughs> so it was really great that I could be there and bring realism mm. and authenticity to the story because it's our story yeah. as Christians. Yeah. And this is like our world, and, and I wanted it to get it right. So when we watch it, yeah. we say, that yeah, this is pretty much how it is. Yeah. But then at the same time, if you're a non-believer, and I feel this movie has a strong appeal to non-Christians, you can, you can see that we were Jesus people. Mm -hmm. That's what we called ourselves, and I love that. Mm -hmm. and that's who we still should be. You know, the problem today, Ruslan, is we're known as Christians for what we're against. Mm. And we have to make stands on issues. Sure, yeah. I'm not against that at yeah, all. Yeah. But at the same time, we also need to be Jesus people yeah. and remind people that there's a God in heaven who loves them, who longs for a relationship with them and be out there in the culture shining as light, but also being salt on the culture and restraining evil. But sometimes I feel like we've swung too far in one direction. Yeah. And we need more Jesus people building bridges instead of burning them. Do you think that perspective it, it flows out of your creative side? Because I, I tend to think guys who come from creative, I mean, you it shows you doing illustrations and yeah. design and all that kind of stuff. I, I didn't even know that about you, right? Yeah. And so I, I, I get this sense that the the creative side of me is like, we need to show the love of Jesus, yeah. contextualize the love of Jesus, speak the gospel to the hurting, to the broken, yeah. to the downtrodden. And then sometimes the other side, the more uh, theological, linear, logical building, we're, we're, you know, institutional, that side can kind of want more of the truth side. Yeah. And so would you say that, that you think that kind of overflows from you first and foremost being a creative and then transitioning into being, you know, a, a pastor of, of a ma massive church? Probably. I mean, I think God uses whatever we bring to the table. Yeah. Maybe it's a few loaves and fish, mm -hmm. and he can take it and he can multiply it. But early in my life, I, God placed on me the calling of evangelist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and a lot of my friends were becoming pastors, and I felt called to be an evangelist. And so that an evangelist is a bridge builder. Mm -hmm. An evangelist is a person that's trying to speak to culture. Yeah. A uh, classic example of evangelism is, you know, Paul on Mars Hill. Yep, yep. And, he, and he builds a bridge to his audience. Yeah. Men of Athens, I perceive that you're religious. I've been walking around seeing all these altars, you know, erected to various gods. And I noticed one erected to the unknown God. Mm -hmm. That's the one I want to talk to you about today. Mm -hmm. That's called building the bridge, Amen. right? And so one of the most powerful tools we have in our evangelistic toolbox is our testimony. Mm -hmm. And I often encourage, encourage Christians, when you're sharing the gospel— a great place to start is with your story yeah. because then you can help a person see, hey, I'm, I haven't always been the way that I am. Yep, yep. This is the way I used to think. And this movie is really that. This is my testimony. Yeah. But it's not just my testimony. It's many people's testimony because yeah. you connected to Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And other people will connect to different characters in different ways. But, you know, the artistic side of me, and specifically I'm a cartoonist, I want to make it funny at times. Yeah. I, I kind of want to make it light when I can make it yeah, light. Yeah. But when we get to the message, you've got to have your ducks in a row. You have to have your, you know, your I's dotted, your T's crossed. And so early on, I I had to really learn my theology. Yeah. And Pastor Chuck Smith pointed me in a great direction. I started building a little library at my Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, my Nave's Topical Bible, I bought the C.H. Spurgeon collection mm -hmm. of books by Martin Lloyd-Jones and G. Campbell Morgan. And I'm like a 17-year-old kid who was a horrible student yeah. reading theology, absorbing it. But then as I digest it and learn it, I want to give it to people, you know, in a way they understand. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I was doing it a certain way when I was 18. Yep. I'm doing it maybe in a different way now that I'm 70. But then again, it hasn't changed that much. Yeah, yeah. 
Wow, man, I have I have so many questions in, in so many different directions I, I, I want to go. Um, okay, so <laughs> you, in the movie, it says, it, 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 it's, uh, spoiler alert, okay, but go see the, the movie. I'm not going <laughs> to give away too much, but um, having transitioned into being an evangelist, yeah. it, it highlights how you've preached in front of total over a million people. Is it was that is that accurate? Is that the number that they, they put in the film? Uh no, I preached to um six million people. Six million. Wow. Bad math on my part. Yeah. In live six, audiences. In live audiences. Yes. And you obviously with the Harvest Crusades locally yeah. here. Um what was that transition? In the in the movie it seemed very seamless. Mm -hmm. But how did it go from being mm -hmm. cartoonist, artist, creative? Yeah. And they make it seem like you just kind of, you know, you were young and you just kind of got a church. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk about a little yeah. bit of like the, the 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 formidable days of you getting into ministry and then I want to get a little bit back into the film. Sure. Well, in the movie toward the end, we have Pastor Chuck played by Kelsey Grammer coming to Greg who's been disillusioned. Uh, in giving him a church, he gives him the keys to a church. Yeah. Well, that's not exactly how it happened. Okay, but, okay. <laughs> so what happened was um, I came to Christ. I was doing my art, and I started speaking here and there, at little home Bible studies, and and but I was out on the street sharing my faith. Then I started traveling with the Christian bands. So I was convinced that God had called me to be an evangelist. Okay. And my hero, my role model at that moment was Billy Graham. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, at Calvary, there was a, a church up in Riverside, an Episcopalian church that wanted to have their own version of the Jesus movement. So Lonnie Frisbee was going up there uh, to speak, and then Lonnie moved off to Florida. That's shown in the film. Mm -hmm. And so they had different pastors speaking at this study, and they were sort of rotating it around. And I was just hanging around in the office. All these other pastors at that time were about 10 years older than me. And they said, well, who's going to go to All Saints? That's the name of the church this week. Well, I went last week. Well, I'm going next week. And they looked at me and said, well, Greg, do you want to go? I said, yeah, I want to go. Because mm -hmm. I was tired of sitting behind a drawing board. Mm -hmm. I wanted to speak to people. Mm. So I went and started speaking at this Bible study, and it started growing and growing. And so what I was doing was starting a church, and I didn't even know it. Mm. This is before you heard of startup churches, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So as it began to grow, people started calling me pastor. Well, I'm basically 18 years old. I've only been a Christian about a year and a half. I hardly feel qualified to be their pastor. Mm -hmm. And I was looking for someone older to take it over, and I couldn't find anyone. So I realized, well, maybe God wants me to do this. So I wanted to be an evangelist, but the Lord led me to become a pastor. Mm. But I did evangelism as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it continued to grow. And finally, the church we were meeting at, we outgrew the church. And so I started looking for a new building, and I found one and told Chuck about it. So he drove up to Riverside from Orange County, and I, he was having a conversation with the realtor. I saw him pull out his checkbook, and he wrote a check for the down payment, and Chuck gave us a loan to buy the church, and we paid him back with interest. So <laughs> <laughs> Chuck was a very good businessman, Ruslan. You need to know that. But, <laughs> but he was also very generous, and yeah. no one would have ever given me a loan to buy a church except wow. for Pastor Chuck. And so that was the beginning of our church, so it wasn't quite like in the movie where yeah. he gives me the keys. Yeah. But in effect, it was pretty much what was happening. Yeah. He was opening a door for me. So now fast forward 30 years. And Chuck asked me to come back to Calvary and do a little midweek Bible study, which I was doing on Monday nights there. And it grew quite large, and a lot of kids are coming to Christ. And Chuck said, why don't we go to a larger venue uh -huh. and do this? And so we went to the Pacific Amphitheater, for like five days, we broke their attendance records. And then the next year, we went to Angel Stadium. And so now fast forward to today, we've been doing this for over 33 years. Wow. And so that's where the evangelistic thing happened. And, and in the interim, I got to know Billy Graham personally. Mm. I've been on his board for 25 years. So as he was ending his crusade ministry, I was starting mine. Mm. And so we became friends, and he asked me to help him with the sermons. Yeah. So I was helping him primarily with illustrations when he preached, and I got to spend a lot of time with them. So it was like I was enrolled in the greatest evangelistic university on earth under the direction of the greatest evangelist, I think, of all time, yeah. apart from the apostles, Billy Graham, the gold standard. Yeah. And so I was able to learn a lot from him, and uh, so that's kind of 
how it happened. Well, you also had Chuck Smith, who's an incredible Bible teacher, yeah. taking people verse by verse through the yeah. Bible. That's kind of what he was yeah. famous for. Yeah. Billy Graham, an incredible evangelist. Yeah. It seemed like just a culmination of all of these different things. Mm -hmm. Did you, did you did, did, was it hard to know that I'm an evangelist, but I, I'm going to wait a couple decades yeah. to really see this thing come to, to fruition in your life, yet you decided to serve as pastor? Yeah, I think it was a source of tension for many years because in my heart, I really wanted to be an evangelist. But as time passed, I began to really enjoy pastoring. Mm. And, and I really enjoyed prepping and delivering messages. Mm -hmm. And I still, to this day, that's the my favorite thing to do. Mm -hmm. To I'm going to work on a text right now. We're going through the book of James. We're in James 5. We're wrapping the book up. I love to go study, begin to put the sermon together, build it, and deliver it. Yeah. I love that part. Yeah, And so... That was a great discipline for me. Yeah. And I think the problem with some evangelists, I wouldn't include Billy in this, is they, they're very undisciplined. Mm. And so they they maybe have 10 little sermons that they keep giving over and over again. Yeah. And I think when you're a pastor, you're forced to, forced in a good way, as John MacArthur once put it, it's the velvet chains of the pastorate. Mm. It's like... You, you have to stay disciplined and keep expanding and growing and learning. You don't have the luxury of being lazy because mm. you can't keep giving the same 10 messages yep. to your congregation year after year and decade after decade. So as I look back on it now, I see God's wisdom in all of it. And there are people that were called to do both. The Spurgeon fancied himself to be an evangelist and a pastor. Yeah. So did Martin Lloyd-Jones. And in a way, even Billy Graham was pastoral in his relationship with presidents yeah. and other people where he would care for them like a shepherd. So, you know, the, I, it. but the door opened for me to do evangelism, and I love evangelism, but I really do love to teach the Bible as well. Yeah, that's beautiful. I, I love that it that it's that it's and both. It's not either or. It's not yeah. a binary. That's that's amazing. Um, coming coming back to the film, yeah. um, with regards to— this tension that we still see, and I know you participated on the Elephant Room, which I thought was amazing. Yeah, um, a great, I think, coming together of people with slight different theological mm -hmm. views, and then d hashing out some of these different issues and different conversations that yeah. people were having. And I, I really wish that would have continued happening. Those types of conversations. Yeah, that, that was really good. Yeah, and so, um, but if you guys haven't seen the Elephant Room, you should really go back and watch the Elephant Room. Um, and we've been talking about doing something similar, but in the movie, you should. in the movie, we see that similar tensions yeah. kind of seemingly sprouting up between Chuck Smith and Lonnie Frisbee yeah. and Chuck Calvary Chapel. I mean, they're continuationists. They believe in the gifts, the whole yeah. bit, right? I don't know if I would, I would probably call them charismatic, but Lonnie was really into the healing and yeah. into um, the prophecy and all that kind of stuff. And, what we in real time back then? What did you make of mm -hmm. the tension there, and and how much of it was theological, and how much of it was method yeah. methods methodological? That's a great question. Well, Pastor Chuck Smith came from the Four Square Church, mm -hmm. which is a charismatic denomination. Okay, it was founded by Amy Simple McPherson, mm -hmm. and so, uh, but yet Chuck, he was a very practical guy. You know, Chuck was. Um, like for on his day off, he likes to go and build things. He's mm -hmm. he's a he's just a very nuts and bolts kind of a person, but also had a great intellect mm -hmm. and a photographic memory, mm -hmm. and and he loved to teach the Bible, and so he kind of was tired of all of the pressure from the denomination that he was from to have the certain numbers and baptize X amount of people, mm -hmm. you know, every month or et cetera. So he kind of forged out and did his own thing, and he ended up taking over a little church called Calvary Chapel that was pre-named, very small group, and he began teaching through the Bible. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the counterculture movement is happening, and all these hippie kids are on drugs and rebelling against culture, and, and Chuck wanted nothing to do with them. Mm -hmm. But Kay, his wife, had a heart for these hippies. In fact, I found this out later, but um, there was a group of hippie kids that would walk back and forth in front of her house almost every day, and she would pray for them. Mm. And later I realized I was in that group of kids because wow. we were doing drugs at this one guy's house that was not far from my high school campus. So we would go back and forth from school to this guy's house right by Chuck and Kay's house. And I didn't even know mm. that was their house. So um, so Chuck met Lonnie 
and and it was like nitro met glycerin, <laughs> right? So there wouldn't have been this Jesus movement without both of them. Yeah, Lonnie was only there for a relatively short period of time, but he was a catalyst for it. And so, you know, we sort of came for Lonnie and we stayed for Chuck. Mm -hmm. If it had only been Lonnie, I almost fear to think what it could have turned into. (laughs) But if it had only been Chuck, I don't know that that would have had the attraction to the kids. You know, what Chuck did, his brilliance was he didn't try to be some hip guy. He just was who he was. He was authentic. But he opened the door. He let the young people come in with their creativity, with their music, uh, with their preaching and all of it and let it happen. But also he was wise and he put up, you know, parameters, mm-hmm. safety parameters to keep us in line. And Lonnie was always bucking against that because mm-hmm. he just, when it was all said and done, Lonnie was like just a Pentecostal preacher mm-hmm. with long hair and a beard, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And so I do believe God had gifted him mm-hmm. and words of knowledge, which is when God reveals to you something about someone, mm-hmm. which sometimes you see it expressed uh, with something like, hey, the Lord's healing someone yeah. right now yeah. and, and that sort of thing. And so he was doing that more and more. But the problem with that Chuck had with it was it was becoming the focus of Lonnie's ministry. Mm. You know, and we believe in signs and wonders, but we don't think Christians should follow signs and wonders. We think signs and wonders should follow Christians. Come on. So God can do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. Yeah. You know, what does the Bible say if we're sick? Are there any sick among you? Call for the elders yep. of the church and yep. let them pray for him and anoint him with oil and the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Yeah. I don't really see a, a person with a healing ministry in the Bible. Mm-hmm. You say, but the apostles heal people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's not that they had healing ministries. Mm-hmm any more than they had exorcism ministries. Mm -hmm. If a demon needed to be cast out, they cast it out. If God wanted to heal someone like the guy at the gate, beautiful, Mm -hmm. Peter pulls him up on his feet. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then what does he do? He preaches the gospel. It was Mm -hmm. always to kind of get the gospel to people. And you think about the book of Acts. It was written over a period of time, maybe 50 years, maybe less. But but those miracles took place over a long period of time. It's not like they had miracles every day. And so I think the problem is people become very focused on miracles and sometimes they can be real and sometimes they can be kind of not real. Yeah. And so I think there was that tension and I think Lonnie should have stayed with Chuck. Yeah. Because as long as Chuck was there, it was the best version of Lonnie that there was. And I think when Lonnie left, he wasn't able to recapture that again. And, and, you know, and the reason this version of the Jesus movement has stood the test of time is because when it was all said and done, we were a church. Yeah. We were just a church. Yeah. We weren't parrot church. We were just a, a people who went to church, and we had a pastor, and we had the normal things that churches do. Yeah. Were there verified miracles that Lonnie performed? Because I've also heard that from different accounts, and I've seen some different documentaries about him. Or was it just mainly kind of words of knowledge in terms of your experience and what you saw? I can only speak to what I saw. I never—I mean, a miracle— that's a pretty big thing. You know, like, I, I believe I saw people healed. Mm-hmm. You know, what I call that a miracle, I'd call it supernatural. Mm-hmm. So it's miraculous. So I guess that could be classified as a miracle of yeah. sorts. Yeah. I, I think there's some miracles that would be more dramatic than others, like the restoration of sight to a blind man mm-hmm. or the ability to walk to mm-hmm. a disabled person. Yeah. I never saw anything like that okay. personally. Okay. And so I'm not saying they were or were not real, uh, but but I do believe there was, you know, there was a supernatural move of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And when you went to church, you could sense it. Yeah. It was thick, almost yeah. like you could cut it with a knife. Yeah. And and I don't think there's anything we can do to create that. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a beautiful thing when it's happening. But but I think Chuck, his wisdom was it was all great, but it's like, let's open our Bibles. Yeah. And that that is the course he stayed on. And I once asked Chuck when he was quite a bit older, I said, Chuck, if an older Chuck could speak to a younger Chuck, what would you tell yourself? Yeah. And his response was, in his words, hold the course. That's my <laughs> version of Chuck, hold the course. I go, what do you mean by that? Like, just keep doing what you're doing, stay in the race. And yeah, yeah that's right, you know, just hold the course. And yeah. so... Chuck held the course, and, and I think that was a smart thing to do. 
Yeah. What's the wildest miracle or anything like that that you saw? Something supernatural? Was it just kind of folks that were on drugs getting off of drugs? What, what do you could, if you could pinpoint to one thing that you saw, maybe that wasn't in the film or was in the film. Nothing is coming to mind off the top of my head, but I will just say this about myself. And I don't, and I don't th- know that I would classify salvation as a miracle, but but it is passing from darkness to light. Yeah. And it is the most important thing of all because you can have a healing, you're still going to die. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could have a miracle, but your life will still come to an end. But mm. salvation is forever. Yeah. And and you know, just looking at my own life, no one ever shared the gospel with me. No one ever invited me to a Christian meeting. Mm-hmm. I literally happened upon it because I met this girl on my high school campus who was a Christian. I didn't know her. I saw she had a Bible. And there was something about her that attracted me. Mm. And it's not that she was the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen. She was cute, you know, but there was something else. And I thought, what is it with this girl? Mm -hmm. And so one day I was walking across my high school campus actually to score some weed. It was called (laughs) Acapulco Gold back in the day. (laughs) I've never heard of that one. (laughs) You buy a lid of it, which is a little plastic bag. I heard there was some, and I was looking for whoever it was that had it. And I walked by this group of Christians singing songs on the front lawn of my high school campus, and this girl was there. And so I sat close enough to eavesdrop on their conversation. And I very quickly dismissed them as crazy. Yeah. But then I thought, but why? Why would they carry Bibles? Why would they talk about God? Why would they sit out on the front lawn of this campus and sing songs about Jesus? And the problem with my narrative was there, there was a few of them that I had known before. One guy I used to party with, and now he's one of them. I know he's not crazy. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking, well, he's one of them. Hmm. And then I just tried this thought on for size. What if it's true? Mm. I thought, no, it can't be. Mm. And I was cynical because of the way I'd been raised. I had to grow up fast. I, I'd i seen so many dark things as a child in the adult world of my mother. Uh, I, I was very hardened and cynical. Yeah. So I dismissed it. But then the thought came back, what if it's true? And then Lonnie Frisbee, who's on my campus, stands up and preaches, and he kind of looks like Jesus. He has long hair and a beard. Yeah, I'm a 17-year-old kid, you know, using drugs, looking for answers on life. And I'm going, wow, this is different. And I don't remember most of his sermon, but I remember when he said, Jesus said, you're for me, you're against me, just like a lightning bolt hit me. Mm. And I looked around at the Christians, and I thought, well, I'm not one of them. Does that mean I'm against Jesus? I don't want to be against Jesus. I believe he's there somewhere. And then Lonnie said, if you want to accept Christ, get up and walk forward right now. And some kids went forward. And I thought, there's no way, no <laughs> way I could do that. Next thing I knew, I was up there. Wow. And here's why I think this is miraculous. So I pray this prayer. The school bell rings. No one gives me a Bible. No one says, hey, Greg, you're a Christian now. Come to church. I just go back to class, and I'd plan that weekend to go off into the mountains and and get high and take LSD. And I, I went on with my friends and I was alone and I was sitting on a rock and I was filling a pipe with weed and getting ready to smoke it. And that same still voice spoke to me again and said, you don't need that anymore. And I'm like, I said, okay, God, I don't know what this is. Yeah. I don't know what this means. Yeah. I don't know how this works. Yeah. But if you're real, you have to make yourself real to me. Yeah. And my life started changing so radically. Again, I didn't know any Christians yet. Now I started getting to know them. Then I went to church and everything started making sense and people explained it. But it was like, we tell people, share your faith because most people come to Christ when a Christian talks to them or invites them to church. No one shared with me. God literally plucked me out of darkness and brought me to himself. So for me, that's a personal miracle. Yeah, no, that's good. And my my, my story is very similar. Same age, Mm. same same kind of thing. Um, there was no one that even told me that looking at porn was wrong wow. or that, you know, Hey, if you slip up with your girlfriend, like yeah. you can't do an, abortions are out. Like those are yeah. those and like, no one had these conversations yeah. with me. I just like instinctively, yeah. it was like the scales fell from my eyes and I just, wow. I just knew. Yeah. And so right around the same age, you know, so that's, 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 that's really interesting. Um, in terms of the window of time, are you, Chuck had Pastor Chuck had to have been really comfortable and solid to be willing to platform mm-hmm. different men, you, uh, Lonnie, what was that window of time between when you were there and then when the church was initially planted? Our church, you mean? Yeah. Uh, that was about probably 
two years? Two years. Wow. So I was just attending church, going all the time, midweek yeah. studies, Sundays, obviously. Yeah. You know, it's so funny because on Sunday morning, Chuck had a traditional church service. He wore a suit. He had hymn books. Yeah. Uh, his wife, Kay, played piano. They had an organ on the stage. We didn't do any of the contemporary Christian music on the stage. Mm-hmm. Sunday morning was just like a normal, regular church. Mm. Uh, Three-point sermon, you know, but then it was the midweek things where, where it was more what we think of as the Jesus movement. Yeah. So I just was around volunteering, helping in any way I could, doing what nobody else wanted to do. You know, I'd hang around the office, and and sometimes when the pastors would go to lunch, I would I would take phone calls, and people didn't know they're talking to an 18 year old kid with, hmm. with very limited theological knowledge. But if there was someone that said, "Hey, someone wants you know a speaker, a pastor to go to a home Bible study." Two hours away, I'd get in my little Corvair, mm. which is featured in the film, yeah. not the Corvette, the Corvair. <laughs> the, the Corvair has the no engine in the front. Yeah. It's, and it's a little, it's the slowest vehicle. I had retread tires because I couldn't afford proper tires. And a retread is when they put a, a, another layer of tire, run your tire, and they were coming off my car all wow. the time on the freeway. And so anyway, so I would just go and do all these things. And one day... One of the pastors said, we need a new doorknob for the church office. And here's some money. Go down to the hardware store and get one. Well, I didn't know much about buying doorknobs. And I felt like I was on a mission for God. I'm going to buy a doorknob for (laughs) God now. You know, so I think it was a willingness to just kind of do whatever needed to be done. And then one thing led to another. And then the doors opened up and I, I found myself speaking more. And then our church began to grow and again, I want to emphasize, you know, because nowadays people start churches all the time. Oh, yeah. There's all kinds of churches. Yep. But but back then, you never heard of a startup church. Mm-hmm. They were established churches. Mm-hmm. And when the pastor left or died, another pastor would come. But you rarely heard of someone taking over like a warehouse or a mm-hmm. movie theater. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was, it was, I had never heard of it before. Yeah. But so we were kind of out there doing something that was fresh and new. Yeah. And so what age are you when you then uh, plant the church? Well, I start the Bible study at the age of 19, and I'm and I'm kind of in the throes of it at the age of 20. Uh-huh. And I would say we officially were starting the church around my late 20s or when I was 21. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Very That's young. A, yeah, very young. And, and how many years was Lonnie around for all of this? Very short period of time. He was almost like... Getting the car started, yeah. you know, that little explosion. He was there. So Calvary Chapel had a little chapel they met in. Then they went to a tent. Right. Then they built their bigger building. Yep. Lonnie was only in the little chapel. By the time Calvary moved to the tent because they couldn't contain all the people, Lonnie was gone. Wow. And he had moved off to Florida because he wanted to work in his marriage. And that's reflected in the film. We show that yep. Lonnie had his struggles. Yep. We show Lonnie was flawed. We Everyone in this film is flawed. Yeah. You know, we're just showing how God did extraordinary things in the lives of ordinary people. Yeah. And and so Lonnie left in short order. I mean, I my tenure there with Lonnie was around a year and a half, I think at the most, and he was gone. Yeah. So we so the whole movie is kind of is is, is that year and a half, Pretty two much. year window yep. of you coming to faith and, yes. and, and everything that happened yep. that kind of sparked this movement. Yep. And so the theme of God using flawed people, yes. right, uh, that was strong and beautiful and all these different things. And, and I'm sure people at this point probably know how Lonnie's story, you know, kind of went off the rails yeah. in the 80s and all this stuff that happened. You want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, Let's if, if you're okay. So, I'm sure. so what do you make of all of that? Like the, the, yeah. the divorce and then him kind of pulling away from everybody and then the homosexuality, mm-hmm. and then the AIDS, and then it seems like he reconciled with everybody towards yeah. the end. What did you make of all? I mean, that's a, I'm, I know I just asked you about a whole decade of time. Yeah, well, um, I think it's important to talk about this because Lonnie, you know, left Calvary. Mm-hmm. He went off to Florida. I kind of lost touch with him mm-hmm. for years. Mm-hmm. And uh, then I heard about what happened. So I would say Lonnie fell away spiritually. Okay. Wow. I, would, I mean, it's clearly was backsliding. Okay. And in his own books that he's written about his life, he talks about how he was up partying, he started using drugs, Mm -hmm. and he was living immorally. I don't know the specifics of his immorality, Mm -hmm. if it involved homosexual encounters. Uh, You know, actually in the film early on when 
when before he was a Christian, when Chuck first meets Lonnie, Lonnie says to Chuck, back in Heat Asbury, we did everyone and everything. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So this was in his background. But during the time of the Jesus movement, I never saw or heard of anything mm-hmm. uh, of that kind. Mm-hmm. And I don't believe it was happening at all in his life. Do you think it was because Chuck was there and there was a support system for him? Pro- and per- certainly contributed to it. He also yeah. was married to Connie yeah. at that time. Yeah. So, so then this is something that happened later. His marriage fell apart. I don't know the details of that. He fell away and he got involved with the vineyard mm-hmm. and, uh, then it came out what he had been doing. And so he kind of kept reemerging here and there, but not really seeming to get traction. And then ultimately he gets AIDS. Mm. So I hear Lonnie is dying of AIDS. So he was in hospice care in Newport Beach. And this I re- is the early 90s? Yes. Yeah. So we were already doing our crusades at this point. <sighs> yeah. And Lonnie had prophesied over me when I was a young man, and this is in the film. Yep. So we were praying for some people. I was kind of hanging around with him for a few months after my conversion. He was praying for some people, and I was just standing there to the side. And he turns to me, and he says, the Lord just told me you're going to preach to thousands of people. Mm around the world. I'm like dumbfounded. I hadn't even <laughs> preached a single sermon. Yep. I mean, I drew a cartoon booklet. That yep. was my claim to fame, if you will. Yep. So this was really surprising. And uh, so anyway, fast forwarding to Lonnie, he's in hospice care. A friend of mine, Mike McIntosh, yeah, and Mike, I heard he about it. He plants at a church out here. Mike McIntosh right. plants at Horizon on That's San Diego. Right. Yeah. So we went to see Lonnie, and I remember it so vividly. It was The room was very dark. There was a big fire in the fireplace. And Lonnie was emaciated. He looked horrible. Mm. But as he began to speak, I sort of saw that old Lonnie spark still. Mm. And Lonnie believed that God was going to heal him. Wow. And he believed he was going to preach. Mm. But I think Mike and I could see this was not going to happen. And I don't know if that was the effects of the AIDS, if he was delusional, but but it was clear. But he was repentant. He knew what he did yeah. was wrong. Yeah. He never was an advocate for yeah. any of it, yeah. but he fell away. So, okay, th- that may trouble some people. Why are you making a movie about Lonnie Frisbee? It's not a movie about Lonnie Frisbee. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a movie about the Jesus movement. Yeah. Lonnie Frisbee played a role. To not put him in there is to edit history. Yep. Chuck Smith played a role. It shows how I came to faith, Kathy came to faith during that time. So, hello, welcome to life. Mm. God uses flawed people. Yeah. What about the story of Samson? Mm-hmm. What about the story of Noah? Mm. After he, you know, bringing the ark safely to land, he goes and deliberately gets drunk and uncovers himself. What about Gideon? Yeah. What about, and the list goes on, right? Mm. So just because someone is used by God doesn't mean they don't have the ability to walk away from it. Mm-hmm. Simon Peter denied Christ three times. Mm-hmm. And he had spent three years plus walking and talking with Jesus every single day. Mm-hmm. But he repented. Mm. So I think the key is, do we come back to the Lord? Yeah. And and that to me is how you know if a person is a believer or not. So if someone goes prodigal, as we say, yeah. if they return to Christ, in my mind, they're a prodigal. If they never come back and they stray and they never return to their faith, mm-hmm. maybe they weren't even a Christian to begin mm-hmm. with. Mm-hmm. Only God knows. But Lonnie was a believer. Yeah. Lonnie was used by God. Mm. Lonnie did play a key role in the last great spiritual awakening in America. Lonnie messed up. Mm. Lonnie fell away. Lonnie returned to the Lord. Lonnie was forgiven. Yeah, that's good. Where What were those conversations like those last couple of days? You said he was on hospice. Did, did, were you guys able to have any, you know, how coherent was he and all that? Well, he was coherent, but he also thought he was going to walk out of there and and preach again. Mm. And I think Mike and I could see that was not going to happen. He was just very thin. His body was emaciated. His eye was closed. It was really tragic, frankly. And uh, I did, I only was with him that one time we prayed together and we left a very sad to think of what could have been. Yeah. You know, the, God can give us potential and we can blow it. Like yeah. Samson had tremendous potential, yeah. but he continued to play with sin, mm. hanging out with prostitutes mm. more than hanging out. And then ultimately, um, you know, falling into sin with Delilah. And, and so his life came to an end and you, and you think what could have been yep. if he had not done that. Yep. So we all can sabotage God's plan for our life. Mm. He does give us a free will. Mm-hmm. 
but he does also give second chances. Yeah. Man, that's good. And, and I think that, that aspect of it is timely because a lot of people right now, whether it's past traumas, whether it's, you know, mental health, mm-hmm. are dealing with so many different things and they want to love on God and they, and yeah. they want to live his ways, yeah. yet there's this dual nature that they're yeah. fighting to suppress. And, and culture and society is telling us, just be your authentic self. Yeah. Just be who you feel like you're supposed to be inside. Yeah. Yeah. And that that I think this is that aspect of the story, I think, is a cautionary tale mm-hmm. for a lot of people, young yeah. people who, man, you can get saved and and and, and you can love God and, and God can use you, but you could still end up in, in a tragic place. That's and, right. And so uh at the end of everything though, Chuck Smith and everybody they didn't Chuck Smith preach at his memorial? He did. Yeah, and so he died in a healthy in a, in, a, in a healthy place with the Lord. It seems like I would say so, one hundred percent. And you know, and and to Chuck's credit, after Lonnie, this is before all this uh, information came out about his lifestyle and and his fall away. Um, Chuck invited Lonnie back a number of times to speak at Calvary. Wow! And so Chuck was always very conciliatory toward Lonnie, mm. and, and really had a heart to try to help him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in in hindsight, you are now fifty years in the Lord. Mm-hmm. No scandals, <laughs> no drama. Uh, what advice do you have? And I know your son is here, and, mm-hmm. and he's a man of God, and yes, he is. and he's doing well. Um, what advice would you have for guys like myself, guys mm-hmm. that are in their thirties, we're just now starting our families to finish well? Wow, you know, so that there is no Samson asterisk yeah. to our names, to our legacy, to our family tree. What, what, what advice would you have? Well, it's an excellent question. You know, I, I I mentioned Billy Graham, and I got to know Billy really well. And I spent a lot of time with him. And he was even more impressive privately than he was publicly because he was such a humble man. And I was always surprised that he even cared about what I, a man in my 30s, would have to say to him, hmm. who was in his late 60s or even early 70s at that point. But he was always curious. I think a good leader will be a good learner and a good listener, Mm. a good reader. They're always wanting to grow. I think when we stop growing is when the problems begin. Mm. You know, because we think, well, I've reached this plateau and I have these accomplishments. But yes, there's always always a vulnerability, no matter where you're at. And so I think that, you know, Chuck's advice was good advice. Hold the course. You know, the end of your life is determined by the beginning of your life. Mm the evening by the morning. So we look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and we see the bold stand they took, and they wouldn't bow before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had erected. But the fortitude to make that decision happens earlier in the book of Daniel when they don't want to eat at the of the food at the king's table. And mm-hmm. we don't even want, know why they didn't eat that food. Mm-hmm. Maybe it wasn't kosher. Uh, maybe... Uh, it was offered to idols, but whatever it was, they made a principled stand in a relatively small area. Mm-hmm. And now as we see them making a strong stand in a much bigger area, we realize this is why. Mm. So I think it starts now. And if you compromise on little things, they can turn into big things. Yeah. It's sort of like chicks. You know, back when I was a kid, believe it or not, at Easter, you could buy little chicks as Easter gifts. Mm-hmm. You would see them at stores like little chicks. Uh, and that's a cute idea until it grows up into a full-grown <laughs> chicken. Do you want a chicken running around your house? You know. Yeah. So I think with sin, we might tolerate little things, yeah. and then little things one day turn into big things. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think you've got to constantly be growing, constantly learning, yeah. applying discipline in your life, mm. and, and and being aware of your propensity to fall. Anyone has the capacity to fall and fall big. So never lose sight of that. That doesn't mean you live in paranoia, but just keep walking closely with Jesus. Keep growing in your faith. Yeah. You know, don't abandon those principles that <laughs> you were practicing when you were a brand new Christian. Mm. You know, I think that people, as Jesus said in Revelation, leave their first love. Yeah. They don't lose it. They leave it. Wow. And so what does Jesus say? He gives the three R's of getting right with him. He says, Remember from where you have fallen, repent, 
and do the first works quickly. So the three R's are remember, repent, repeat. Mm. You never outgrow the need to open the Bible every day. Yeah. You never outgrow the need to be a part of a church. Yeah. You never outgrow the need to have a prayer life. Yeah. You never outgrow the need to share your faith. And it's a need for you too, yep. not just for the non-believer, but it replenishes you. And I would add a great way to keep yourself vibrant spiritually is to disciple people. Yeah. I mean, that's a great commission. Yeah. Go into all the world, preach the gospel. Yes. That's Mark's version. Yes. Matthew's version is making disciples of all nations, yeah. baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yep. And I think when you have a new believer in your life, they sort of um, energize you and you stabilize them. Yeah, that's good. So, you know, kind of going back to my life. So I'm a brand new Christian. I'm trying to sort it out. I don't really have any Christian friends yet. And this guy named Mark comes up to me. Didn't know him from Adam's house cat. Kind of, I don't, I wouldn't call him a cool guy, you know, in my estimation of cool back then. Hi, my name's Mark. Okay. Yeah, I saw you accepted Christ the other day. Yeah, I'm a little defensive. Yeah. Well, I want to take you to church. No, that's okay. No, I'm going to take you to church. No, no, I'm good. I don't want to go. Where do you live? I'm picking you up. Next thing I know, I'm in a car with this Mark guy going to church. He takes me to Calvary Chapel. Then he takes me to his home. He has Christian parents. And I'm sitting around the table having dinner with them. And we're talking about the Bible. He was discipling me. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, just as important as Lonnie was to get my attention to bring me to Christ, Mark was there to help me get grounded. Mm. We need to be that person for someone else. Yeah. You don't have to be a theologian. Yep. You just need to be a friend. That's good. That's good. I um, I have a couple more questions okay. for you. Uh, guys, if you're here, we're going to be going to our Patreon-exclusive segments. We're going to talk about revival today, what that would look like. I have a question about some billboards that uh, apparently— Harvest Church caught some flack for a couple years ago. And um, I have a question about deconstruction. So if you guys want to enjoy that part of the conversation, it'll be on our Patreon community. So, hey, if you enjoyed this video and you want to see the full extended version of this podcast, be sure to sign up for our Patreon community for only $5 a month. It'll really help us continue contextualizing the gospel using YouTube, media, and podcasting. And in exchange, you will get full unedited versions of the podcast, of our daily after-party streams, a discount for our merch store, and exclusive access to our private Discord server. It's only $5 a month. The link for Patreon is in the description of this video, as well as the pinned comment below. Again, hit the link in the description, sign up now, and I'll see you over there, all right? Peace.